Hey, Earthlings of the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for joining me. So we're into another time tunnel. And as we know, we're trying to build up a kind of archive of, um, well, maybe we could call it significant events in the history of the animal uh, movement. Uh, this one is quite significant in the sense that it, I was involved in, in it, in the sense that um, it was part of what was eventually called the Seal Wars, and I had a very kind of small part to play around about 1981. And so that's the substance of, uh, of where we are today. So uh, welcome along to another time tunnel. Yeah, so we're into Save the Seal territory, and um, we're talking about the Orkney Islands. Um, now, sometimes people don't know where that is, and so this is a map uh, to show you about that. So we talked about the north of uh, Scotland here. Um, so the Orkneys uh, are the circled bunch of islands in that one on the left there, and it's in between the mainland Scotland and the Shetland Islands. And then this picture on the, the second picture, really, is um, the actual Orkney Islands themselves. There's quite a conglomeration of different islands, as you can see. Uh, the main one in the middle is called the mainland. And um, Kirkwall is the capital. So if you see all the ones that are, are kind of, as it were, to the north or above uh, Kirkwall, that's where the actual seals were being killed. And that's where we sail to from uh the mainland so that's where it all kind of happened so that's that's the um the that's the kind of geography of the situation so this story involves um sea shepherd or sea shepherd conservation society and also the hunt saboteurs and also greenpeace international not to be confused with greenpeace london now i always say that i don't know if they've ever been confused so, um, but I always say it in a way. So maybe if they've never been confused, it's because of me, but we're talking about Greenpeace International, you know, the famous conservation group, um, in, in other words. So setting the scene for us then is a newspaper called the Orcadian. And it reports that the seal population had increased around the Orkneys uh, from the end of the Second World War. There's some speculation about why the population increased. I think, although just speculation really, is I think it might have increased because of the war itself. In other words, seals who were located further south around Britain were driven north by the bombing. And also, um, and this, this came up with uh, in COVID really, it was reported that the, the whales were thriving because there was less boats uh, in the sea and their screws, you know, the propeller, create a lot of turbulence and noise. And so if you imagine wartime, it must have been really bad because there's been a big increase in submarines, for example. And so the chances are that the seals were driven north uh, from around Britain and they found themselves in the Orkney Islands. And presumably once they found a safe place and a quiet place, they stayed, I suppose. So this uh, Orcadian article is talking about the so-called seal wars of the 1970s and very early 80s. And so because of this population increase, then the Scottish office started to issue licenses to kill a number of seals every year. And usually it was about 1,000 to 2,000 uh, individuals. But then in 1978, there's a crunch year because the Scottish office really increased the numbers of licenses. And um, we, we got reports that we were talking about maybe 6,000 rather than 1,000 or 2,000. And according to this report, it says there's going to be 900 mothers killed and 4,000 uh, seal pups uh, killed. What seems to have encouraged Greenpeace to become involved was this kind of close to 6,000 seal um, kill. Other people got involved because of the publicity that was caused by all this. Uh, Bridget Bardot, the right-wing actress, uh, was involved. And at the time, the Orkney MP, Member of Parliament, was called Joe Grimmond. 
and he received a petition signed by over 6,000 people. But that was 6,000 people from within the Orkney Islands themselves, which is pretty good. And he also received 118 letters of protest from within the islands uh, as well. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty good percentage. There were about 18,000 humans at the time living in the Orkney Islands. Uh, nowadays, it's more like uh, 22,000, maybe 25,000 by now. So if you see the insert there, the, the bit to the right, he says that 100 journalists had descended on the, the islands in 1978, which is quite a lot of people to, uh, to accommodate, as you can imagine, on these small islands. And Grimman says that all told, he received 2,787 letters about the seals, and all but seven of those people opposed uh, the kill. So it had become quite an international story uh, really, and involved Greenpeace, as I said. Then there's a little mention at the bottom of your little insert there about Margaret Thatcher. And it says this, former Prime Minister uh, once said that during her tenure at Downing Street, the welfare of seals was the most common topic raised in her post bag. So <clears throat> I suppose you could say that um, <laughs> this is animal loving uh, Britain, I suppose. Uh, were they being killed for food? Um, no, they were just being killed. In fact, um, I'll tell you the story about why they were being killed in in a, in a few minutes. But they weren't they weren't killed for food. They were killed to reduce the population uh, numbers. Whether anyone actually then went on to eat them, I'm not totally sure about that. But that wasn't the primary reason for it. So this uh, here is. Um, a journalist called John Craven, and he used to have this children's program, which was called John Craven's News Round, and that covered the story in 1978. And I think I was living in outer London at the time, and I saw this broadcast. And um, yeah, I think the fishermen claim they eat their income. Yeah, that's what I'm just about to tell you. So what I remember is during the report, um, a fisher person in the Orkneys said that the seals were eating our fish, as he put it. And that struck me as rather odd. And I was thinking, well, doesn't that really mean that the seals got to the fishers before you did? And so that always struck me as, um, as unfair and uh, unjust. And so that started my journey to veganism, really. And so I started to boycott the flesh of fishers while still eating other types of animal flesh, which obviously uh, didn't make sense. So within about three months of doing that, I was a fully fledged, uh, fledged vegan. Interesting, when I think about my first few months of veganism, maybe I was plant-based. It's, it's, it's hard to know when the full philosophy of veganism sinks in, in a way. But um, so, so that was kind of my story. It, it, it was created by this, uh, controversy about uh, the seals. Um, this is the BBC talking about it, uh, reports on the involvement of um, Greenpeace, as you can see. And there's two pictures of the Rainbow Warrior uh, in there. The picture on the right uh, tagged the Guardian. That's actually the Rainbow Warrior after it had been sunk. It had been blown up by uh, the French government and their secret service. And this was 1985. Uh, one person, a photographer, uh, was murdered in the attack. And uh, he actually drowned because he'd gone back into the sinking boat to try and recover his cameras. Other crew members were blasted into the water by a second explosion. So it, it was a kind of big deal, especially because it involved the French government. It, it was a scandal, really, and re resulted in resignation of the French defence minister who was called charge a new two french agents pleaded guilty to manslaughter and they became sentenced to 10 years in prison although this won't surprise you too much they spent little over two years uh in a prison on the polynesian island and then they were released by the french government so that's the way that those things uh usually work so this bbc um report uh, failed to mention that the hunt saboteurs um, 
were there, but they were actually there. And so this is what created the involvement of Sea Shepherd because the Scottish office at this point, in fact, the, the headline here, Grey Seal Cull Dramatically Reduced, uh, the Scottish office backed down because of the involvement of Sea Shepherd, um, Greenpeace and all this kind of stuff. All the publicity, all pretty bad publicity. So they go back to the idea of the original 2000 uh, kill. And Greenpeace being a conservation group rather than an animal rights group, they declared that to be a victory. So they opened up their champagne and essentially um, they sailed off, um, leaving uh, the Sabs to say, well, what about the 2000 who are going to be killed uh, anyway? The BB said this, just only just 2000 kills uh, seals will now be killed. Uh, 2,300 less uh, than originally planned. I think that should be 2,300 fewer, I think, in terms of English, but anyway. Okay, so um, that's the kind of uh, scene, scene for it. And um, to paint a, bit, a little bit more of the picture, I'm going to show you a, a video. Now, the first part of this video was from 1978, the, the year in question, as it were, when the big increase um, started. And then the second part was uploaded in 2018. The interesting part of the second part is that it shows that the problem of the seals and the sealers and the killers had remained, but for a different reason, which, which was fish farming. So that's quite interesting. And also the report mentions shooting. So that's one difference between what goes on in the Orkneys and in Britain, for example, they shoot the seals, whereas obviously if you think about the Canadian uh, kill in Newfoundland, then you're talking about the clubbing uh, of seals. So it, it is a bit different in, in that sense. Well, if the call were not to take place, I would say that the, the future looks very bleak for a big percentage of the fishermen around Orkney. They might have to give up? In the long term, if the seals continue to multiply as they're doing and nothing's done about it, it's fairly obvious they'll have to give up because there's no alternate fishing for them to go to. We don't know enough about just what effect the cull will have on the shellfish industry. After all, these uh, seals do eat the predators of lobsters and crabs. And so they could be an advantage to the shellfish industry? In my opinion, I think there's a considerable advantage in maintaining the uh, seal population, certainly on the scale it has been in the past, unless there's some um, evidence to show otherwise. I'm not at all happy that it is necessary to kill such a large number of seals. And here you can see the Greenpeace Warrior uh, flagship, Rainbow Warrior there. Scotland is a good place for both common and grey seals due to the wild and remote coastline, which provides safe places to haul ashore and to breed with nearby rich foraging grounds. With more than 250 salmon farm sites in Scotland and a seemingly endless supply of what would be natural seal food, it's not surprising there is an issue of conflict. The Marine Scotland Act was put in place in 2010 to ensure the protection of our seals and to enforce appropriate management of seals here in the UK. So the shooting of seals is something that is happening here in the UK and is licensed. This licensing to shoot seals has been put in place to protect the fish and to reduce the damage to farms. Salmon farms are an important industry for Scotland, but the good news is that it is possible for them to coexist alongside seals without the loss of fish or shooting of seals. There are a variety of methods that can be employed to protect seals. One of the most commonly used is ADDs, or acoustic deterrent devices. They make painfully loud underwater noises which the salmon farms use to keep the seals away from their salmon pens. I met up with David Ainsley who's been looking into the use of ADDs by salmon farms in Scotland and their effect on seals and other wildlife. They're not particularly good at keeping seals and salmon separated 
because um, the seals can either be eventually deafened by the ADDs or they keep their heads above the water so that the ADDs are not effective. And seals can learn um, that the noise from the ADDs is a dinner bell showing them where the fish farms are and, and, and where the food is. Really? Okay, so it's almost like the opposite effect. Ah, I was muted. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say that all again. So there's a, there's a time shift here. So this is the siege, um, Greenpeace statement. Um, they declared victory. And then Wilkinson, who is the director, said, we have always said that there's a case for culling the seals, that evidence has simply not been made uh, available. So essentially, Greenpeace was saying it was the size of the cull which was the issue for them, rather than the cult itself. And so this is why the Orkney campaign transferred to Sea Shepherd uh, or the European version of Sea Shepherd and also the Hunt Saboteur. So rather than Greenpeace and, and the Sabs, it ended up being uh, Sea Shepherd and the Sabs. So Sea Shepherd uh, Europe um, was based in Glasgow and the European director was this guy here called Dave McCall. Now, I knew Dave pretty well in the sense that we were both on the BUAV committee in 1982. So that's the British Union for the Abolition of uh, Vivisection. Now, the interesting thing about Dave is that he's almost been totally erased from Sea Shepherd history. And there is a possibility that um, he may have fallen out with Paul Watson, but I don't know that for certain. But certainly, if you look at um, sea Shepherd history, either online or in books, for example. You don't get a lot about Dave McCall, although he was the prime mover in this particular thing. So he organized the sabotage of um, a kill in uh, 81, and the Merseyside Sea Shepherd uh, joined that campaign, and I was kind of affiliated with that at the time. The prime mover of Merseyside Sea Shepherd was somebody called Kevin Lee, and we're going to meet him again in some press coverage uh, a little later on. So, so that was a scene. Uh, so we'd moved from the late 70s into the 80s, and then we had to start some kind of training. So this is, um, this is a sea rider, my, my, my favorite type of boat. So it's a semi-inflatable speedboat, um, essentially. So this is what we would mainly be using in the Orkneys. And so uh kevin lee had bought one and then it was a question of us getting used to use of them and, and getting used to launching them in particular now that was interesting in the sense that we would go to on, on a stormy day we would go to uh, the wirral which is near liverpool where there's strong winds and high tides and we would try to launch the boats into the water and um, it, was, it was very difficult, as you can imagine. And, and the locals would come down and they would say, do you know, there's a jetty just up there and you could just wheel the thing into the water. So we had to explain, well, yeah, but the idea which we're training for an operation here. So that's why we're deliberately um, going into the rough sea. So it turned out that I, I got quite good at kind of walking backwards into the sea uh, with... Um, with the boat, you know, up here, as it were, and wait for a big wave. And I would push the boat upwards. And so the bottom, the bottom of the boat would be hit by a wave and then it would go over it. And then they would drag me into the sea rider. And so, so we, we ended up being pretty good at launching um, into really rough seas, which we knew we would have to do once we got to the Orkneys, because we were going to be going to a lot of uninhabited islands where there was no facilities for um, things. Same nonsense in Ireland in 2020 down in Kerry. The poor old fishermen had their livelihoods impacted 
by all the aggressive seal monsters. Yes, in fact, a, a year after this, um, the Sabs who took part in the Orkneys went to Mayo because there was a seal call in Ireland. Um, so that must have been 83, I think. And um, because I, I'd, I'd opened the first animal rights shop in Britain at the time. So I stayed uh, to keep that going while, while most of the people in this story went over to, to Ireland the following year. So the Merseyside people go, um, they claim that they were concerned that the seals would attack you. <laughs> yes, of course, of course they would. They'd come steaming out and, and rush into the, all the playgrounds and have a real go at the kids. Yes, of course they would. So the Sea Shepherd uh, Merseyside people arrive in Glasgow um, and it was mainly, mainly the, the Sabs there, but that's where the, the Sea Shepherd were based as well. And we were told the great plan of action and there was two parts to it. The first one meant that the idea was to surround the killers who had the gun and keep knocking the barrel of the gun into the air so he couldn't point it at the seals. And then part two, or the second part, plan B, was to spray uh, the seals uh, to make them commercially uh, unvaluable. Um, so that answers Deb's question in the sense that I think they were selling the pelts uh, as well as just, just killing them. So, so, so there is that. It's interesting, though, because we saw, as we were sailing past some of the islands, we saw them shooting. And the effect of the gun would be that the seal put would roll off a cliff. And, of course, then they wouldn't be, be counted in the kill or the kill. So um, in that sense, uh, there was probably always more killed than were licensed for because they obviously would just arrive with the right, right amount, but they'd kill loads of them who'd ended up in the sea, as it, as it were. So um, we end up going to the Orkneys, and um, this is some of the press that resulted um, a year later, really. I'm going to put this on full screen so I can give you a flavor of, of what's going on. Uh, it says, far a seal call confrontation, protesters find. So I'm just going to read you the first, most of the first column and some of the third one, really. Seven Sea Shepherd seal call protesters who were arrested on North Farah in November last year appeared for trial at Kirkwall Sheriff Court on Tuesday after denying charge of assault and breach of the peace. Mr. Marcus Hewitt, farmer, Scal Cottage Westray, said, um, told the court that he and Mr. John Hercus, I think it is Hercus, uh, Gretna Green Westray, had licensed to cull 250 grey seal pups during the annual seal cull. Uh, Mr. Hewitson said that he was aware that a group of protesters had arrived on the island, uh, and so he asked for a police presence um, on the island when, when he, he got there to do the kill. Mr. Hewson said that the police had signaled to him to come ashore and warned him to keep his .22 rifle in the air unloaded and only to shoot when it was safe. They had gone to the south end of the island, followed by the protesters who called him a bloody murderer and the lowest filth amongst other abuse. He loaded his rifle uh, with the intention of shooting a seal pup when the gun was grabbed by Cl Clive John Swinscoe uh, and one uh, or three others then jumped in on top of him. Uh, one was Kevin Joseph Patrick Lee and he put his arms around Mr. Ewison causing him to have a nosebleed and then um, Kevin Lee's wife was also arrested. She'd put herself in front of the, or between the gun and the seals, which was kind of, as it were, uh, the plan. And then it says here, uh, Mr. Ewinson said that uh, he shot the seals as part of his livelihood and had been agitated by the incidents. European director of the Sea Shepherd Conservation Group, Dave McCall, who organized the trip to Orkneys, said that there have been rumors that seals were being culled out of bounds islands uh, illegally 
and the group had uh, formed a policy of direct action tactics, including spraying seals with dye to make their pe um, pelts commercially valueless. He said that all members of the group were against any sort of violence and would not use abusive language. He found the charges hard to believe. So that was the um, that was a subsequent um, court case uh, report. He said about uh, seven arrests, as I said, confrontation with the sealers. Um, so I don't really know how, how accurate this report is because I, I wasn't actually involved with these confrontations uh, because I was involved with uh, being on, on the boats. Um, but it, I mean, all of that wasn't the methodology agreed as it were uh, back in Glasgow, but um, we shall see. For the, for the rest of the time, when we arrived in, in Orkney's, Sea Shepherd had, had um, rented out two small cottages uh, and also a um, an office in a in a hotel for the duration. And so uh, this here is Mick uh, Heslin and myself uh, in one of the cottages. Uh, that's me on the right. So the party was split up as 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 follows. We had two or maybe three groups who would set up camps on uninhabited islands, which were suspected to be where the seal uh, killers would land. So that was one of the, the main plans. Uh, we did a seal demo in Toronto and the NP's office recently. No response, but fake blood poured in front. Not sure if you know Jerry and Peter McQueen. No, I don't actually know them. No, I don't. Okay, so um, as I said, I wasn't involved in that confrontation. I was part of the sea. Uh, rider crew. So our job really was to ferry people and supplies uh, around during the kind of operation. Uh, the captain of one of the sea riders was an experienced seafarer. And I was trying to think of his name and I can't think of it. I think it James something, but I'm not sure. But he was experienced because he used to be part of Greenpeace International before he got involved with uh, Sea Shepherd. Now, the Scotsman, which published um, a special uh, mag one year later, um, a, a glossy mag to go with the paper, reported that I had no experience of, of sailing, but I was learning fast. So that was our job, really, to kind of ferry people and supplies uh, uh, around, because obviously when we got reports about where the sealers had been, then the camps had to, to move around as well. So one time when we were out at sea, we discovered that we had been sabotaged. So it transpired that the seal killers, or somebody acting on their behalf at least, had sabotaged one of the sea riders by putting salt in the petrol tanks. And so that meant that the engines conked out and we, we broke down um, at sea. It was a bit dusky at the time, and we could see a distant island, and so we resorted to rowing there. And we got there, but it was dark by the time we arrived. Some Somebody on the boat worked out that this island was one of the ones which already had a Sea Shepherd camp on it. So, so, that, so that was a good idea. Um, but we had a problem in the sense that we couldn't land the boat because of the jagged rocks. And also it's pitch black now. And so we had a real kind of problem. So we decided to split up and some people went off to the camp to try and get people to come back. And the idea was then to lift, with a lot of people, lift the boat over the rocks onto, onto the sand. That was the plan. So while they'd gone, uh, myself and this guy called Jerry from Manchester, we waited with the boat. Uh, essentially, that meant that we were holding the boat out from the rocks. Uh, you know, And obviously, we had, we had to wait a considerable time and then sadly, uh, unexpectedly, Jerry got hypothermia. And so we had no kind of choice really, but we had to get him into the into the sea rider. And he, he was he was really kind of shaking and, and stuff. And so I got in as well to the sea rider. And then um, I tried to kind of cuddle him to try and warm him up and this kind of stuff. But then I realized that the sea rider had drifted back out to sea. You could just tell by the stars that some, you know, we're moving again, as it were. And so I had to abandon Jerry and jump back into the water and guide the boat back to close to the to the rocks where, where it was in the first place. 
So managed to get it back into position. And then the only other thing I remember there was some of the adult seals decided to play games uh, with us. For example, I was up to my chest in, in water and uh, suddenly a seal would pop a, a head out of the, the water and kind of spit water at us and then and then dive again. And, and one thing about that was interesting because when they were on land, they, they weren't very agile. Um, as you can imagine, but when they're in the sea, it's absolutely amazing to see them darting around and changing direction uh, and all that. Obviously, that's their element. So, so they they were kind of playing uh, playing around with me a, a little bit. Um, but they, there you go. Right. So I'm going to bring this back in uh, to there. I think. Okay. So the help returned, but by this time it was starting to get light enough to see what was going on. And so this is a, a picture of the sea rider who's been pulled up uh, over the rocks uh, and out of the way of the tide. So even if the tide comes in, the sea rider would be safe. Um, interesting, actually, because I think this kind of safe area was pretty close to where the rocks were, but we couldn't see. So it would have probably been quite easy to have to have landed if we'd have only known, but we, we didn't know at the time, so there's nothing we could do. So obviously, in terms of what was going on, Jerry became our main concern. Um, he was in a real state at this time. Um, he was shaking, uh, kind of blubbering a little bit, but he, he couldn't really walk. So we had to kind of, um, we had to frog march him to the camp. Are we, are we allowed to say frog march? He, anyway, he was, he was in quite a, a mess. And the other complication was that from where the boat was to where the camp was there was there was three locked gates and fencing and the, and the gates were chained and then the only thing we could do with jerry because he was a dead weight at this time is we had to kind of just throw him over over the other side of of, of the um the fences and then climb over and pick him back up again we had to do that uh, three times uh so he was he was in a bad way by the time we got into the camp as you can imagine once we got into the camp, uh, his clothes were taken off him and he got put into a very large sleeping bag. And two people joined him in there ju just, just to warm him up. And so then emergency fla flares were set off and the lifeboat eventually came out. And we were taken back to Kirkwall, the, the capital of, uh, of the Or Orkneys. Now, the Sea Shepherd was just abandoned because there's nothing we could, we could do uh, at the time. By the time we got back to the capital, a few of us were told that we would actually have to go back out again. And the reason for that is that the weather had deteriorated badly and was expected uh, to get worse. So if you look at this, this is the Beaufort wind scale. So we were told that um, the camps were going to be subject to these Beaufort wind scales of 10, 11, and 12. So these, these are things like uh, storms, violent storms, and then hurricane force. And so um, this meant very, very high winds and massive waves. And one of the camps, I think maybe it might have been the remaining camp, was in a it kind of situated in tents within a broken down cottage. But really, we're just talking about just the walls left and no roof. And so there was a real concern that the walls would collapse onto the tent. And so um, we thought we were going to have to go and rescue the people. Um, and as I said, I think it was the only camp left. I think others have had been moved, returned or been arrested. And uh, so we, we made them um, a priority. Now, there was a North American journalist um, who was part of the adventure called Mary Bloom. And she arranged with an editor to hire a fishing trawler and its crew uh, to go back out. So um, this is a picture here with Mary Bloom in the middle. Um, I'm, I'm the next one along uh, with the hat. Uh, well, there's two people with the hat <laughs> and the one with the beard. And then the confusion here is the fact that we, I think this might be in the trawler going out to the island. The confusion for me is that the person at the end, I think is Dave Callender. Now, Dave Callender was on the island. So there's obviously a kind of 
juxtaposition with regard to the photographs and and, and the events uh, going going off. But it's Dave Callender was was the kind of problem, uh, if you like. So by the time we get to the island, the seas are getting pretty rough. So what happens then is the trawler makes a lee, which manoeuvres maneuv itself to, to create a kind of calm area between itself and the shore, because the trawler itself can't land. So we have to go off with the um, sea rider again to get to the camp. We get to the camp and tell the people there what the problem is and that they've been advised that they've got to leave and they refuse to leave. They said, but we're expecting the sealers the following day, we'll risk it, risk it for a vegan biscuit. They didn't say. So we we just had to say, okay, well, you know, your choice on that. And so we, we just sailed away again, but we decided to rescue the sea rider on the way back. And once we'd got the sea rider, then it was back to Kirkwall uh, once more uh, and the capital. Roger walks the talk. <laughs> well, it's it, I'm I'm not trying to make it dramatic. I'm just just kind of telling you what what it was. A bit boys' home, I suppose. The actually one of the scariest bits is now in the sense that we were going back. The storm was getting worse and worse, and we were getting thrown around quite a lot. Um, but we had the sea rider on tow, so some of us were at the back of the trawler, trying to ensure that that the sea rider didn't you know the rope and everything wouldn't snap but the problem was that the sea was so bad that one minute the sea rider would be kind of towering above you and then the next second it would be below you and then sometimes the rope would go um slack and then when the boats came together again it would kind of thwack so it was, it was pretty dangerous um, so much so that in the end, the captain of the trawler said to us, you need to get into the galley, which is at the front of the boat, and just leave the sea rider. And if, if it goes, it goes. Nothing we can we can do about it. And so um, that's what we decided to do. And then the only, mem the only memory of the galley that I had was there was a, a stove in there which was lit and everything. And one big wave hit us, and, and I was thrown backwards onto the stove and all my coat started sizzling and stuff, and I rolled off and all this kind of stuff. But um, that that was the scariest bit. It wasn't the police. It, it, it was it was the weather, um, essentially. So eventually we get back, and um, Dave McCall had arranged for the sea rider to go to a ship's chandler, uh, a place to be to be cleaned of, of the salt. Uh, because of the fact that the salt was put into the fuel tanks it meant that the salt was everywhere all, all the piping into the engine and everything else so that really meant meant that the sea rider would have to be virtually taken apart and that would take all night but they decided that they they would do that for us and the guy called in his entire team of mechanics and they worked all night uh, to do to do this job now the the guy that i said was a experienced a seafarer is in this picture. He's the guy on the left. I'm the one in the middle, and um, you can tell you can tell he's a seafarer because he's got a, a roller neck uh, uh, jumper. So we just had to wait until next morning. And I do remember that Dave McCall was getting a bit agitated about the money situation at this stage because um, he didn't know if he's going to have enough to pay for the repair especially if there were several mechanics working all the way through the night. So we kind of timidly went down in the morning to find out what the score was, as it were, and they refused to pay. Uh, they refused payment. So um, they said, no, here's the boat. It's, it's all free. So Dave went scuttling back to his old hotel. And for some reason, he had um, a big crate of... Uh, Scottish whiskey in the hotel room. I think I think to kind of give to journalists during press press conferences and stuff. I think I think that's what the official uh, thing was. And so we took several bo bottles of that back to the um, the shipyard, and um, we gave them out uh, to him. So so the boat was uh, backing in working order, and so then we were able to 
you know, do things like get equipment and all the rest of it. But essentially, that's kind of the end of uh, the story, really. A few people have been arrested and then bailed. Uh, we had the, the boat that was broken down and then uh, recovered. And luckily, we didn't have to pay too much. So that's the end of the story, apart from this, which is a picture of us sabbing a, a hunt on the way back uh, to Glasgow. The guy on the left, that's Clive Swinsco from that story. I'm the one at the top in the red. Uh, Dave Callan just below me, Mick uh, to his right. <laughs> no, left, right. Um, I'm bad at that. Okay, so uh, Clive knew knew all the, the hunts in Scotland. And so um, he, he knew which, which hunt would be out that, that day. And so we, we did a sab on, on the way back. Clive was also, in fact, if you could see a big picture of that, uh, you can see he's got binoculars. He was he was a big bird watcher, and um, he would stop. He would stop us every now and again. The Land Rover would screech to to a <laughs> to a halt, and he'd go, "Oh, I've just seen X X, you know, rare bird." And we had to then stay there for forty minutes while 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 Clive did his did his thing. So it took us a while to get back, uh, I suppose. Right, so that's the, the end of all this, um, except for this. So these are, these are the, the guys, the, uh, the guys and gals, the lads and lasses who caused all the trouble. So, the, so here is a, um, a gray seal pup. Um, can we put that message back up? I didn't, I didn't see it. <laughs> you paid them with yeah we probably did <laughs> i think to be honest on the grounds that they were living on the orkneys there was no trees on the orkneys because the wind was so ferocious that um there was there was no there was no trees you know and um i think there were, might be kind of bushes or you know very kind of little ones which tended to be all bent over and everything but there was no kind of forest or anything, anything like that so fascinating overview so um, we, could, we can have a couple more minutes if anybody wants to ask any more uh, questions. So another, another um, time tunnel. They sure look ferocious, well, those seals. <laughs> those are the ones attacking the children in Ireland, uh, I think is, is what we're saying. Or was, was, was that in, in North America? Right. Okay, so I think we might be done. Thank you once again for everybody tuning in. And um, this archive is available on my YouTube channel. So if you go to the um, playlist, it's got, I think it's, I think it's titled Roger's Vegan Time Tunnel, I think it's called. Yes, uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, Paul, Paul Watson, um, he'd been a very controversial character right from the start. Paul Watson. Uh, and so I do know that he had a kind of history of rubbing people up the wrong way, also firing people he, he didn't like. Um, and then I think once they got really famous and ended up on the TV with things like this, the um, Whale Wars series, I think it, you know, he, he got a bit of a, of a kind of ego about him. I think that may have um, may have been the case. But I mean, obviously, it's really interesting that somebody gets removed from the organization that he started. But then again, <laughs> this is obviously like capitalism. A lot of directors get removed from the companies that they begin. It's kind of um, thing, you know. Have you heard about Samuel Rostall Roger? Samuel Rostall. Oh, right. No, I, I haven't heard of that. I've not, I've not really kept up with the modern history of Sea Shepherd, uh, to be honest. I, I do have another time tunnel about the beginning of Sea Shepherd and the fact that Watson gets expelled from Greenpeace for being too violent and this kind of stuff. Um, so I know more about the beginning of um, Sea Shepherd than, than I do now. But that's a fascinating story about the, the first Sea Shepherd boats uh, which were actually purchased in Britain and I think one of them might have been from Glasgow. And that's probably how Dave McCall got involved. And they, they ended up blowing up their own boats and everything. It's a really fascinating story involving a pirate whaler called the Sierra. 
did you get into any 50 no no not not me <laughs> not me in fact um as a reflection of, of that the fact that they received quite a large petition from within the orkneys uh it may have been the people on the mainland there may be a difference between the people on the mainland and people in the outlying islands but everybody was very friendly uh, towards us i don't remember any uh, problems at all although i did think we might have had a pol policy of not going to the pubs and stuff like that um which might, might also be a, a reason for dave mccall's crate of uh, whiskey but um yeah i don't i don't remember any kind of trouble really it would be cool to have him on once Oh yeah, well, it might it might be an interesting guest for the Armour Rights show. So um, if you've got any contact uh, details, uh, send send them along. You can send them to uh, Roger Yates oh seven oh eight at gmail uh, dot com. I think that's uh, one thing we can do. Right, people, thank you once again for being here, and we shall see you uh, next week. So uh, bye for now. <laughs>